Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have our great guest all the way from Denver, Colorado. Welcome to the show, Martha Weidman. Hi, Victor. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Well, Martha, you've been at this game a little while, and I'm really excited about having this conversation because you're in a particular niche or niche, depending on how you like to phrase it, that is a little bit off the beaten path, but I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But before we dive into the details, why don't you give a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey? Sure. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nine Dot Arts, and we started Nine Dot in 2009. So going through our second big economic transition at this particular time, but have learned a lot through each stage and excited to be here today and tell your listeners a little bit more about how to use artwork to add value to real estate. I'm such a big believer that there are a few things that can create a feeling for a property. And when we build brand new product, that's predominantly our business. It's about creating that look and feel. It's about creating those compelling spaces, not just from a functional perspective, but creating compelling spaces that people say, wow, that's home. Because it doesn't matter whether they own or whether they are renting, it's still their home. And it's got to be magnetic. It's got to be someplace that they instantly feel at home. And so that is just so important. We're, in fact, we're going through this exercise right now in the interior design of an assisted living project that we're going through. And so maybe we'll have a follow-on conversation after this recording about artwork as we're in the process of selecting artwork for that project. So fantastic. Your focus is on multifamily, correct? We actually work in a number of different industries. About a third of our business is multifamily, a third hospitality. Then we do large-scale public art master plans, mixed-use projects, corporate office, and a little bit of healthcare. So we're across many different industry sectors. When it comes to designing a space from an artwork perspective, how do you even go through that process? I mean, you can select someone and simply base the decision on budget, or you could make the decision based on, let's say, design sensibility. How do you even select someone to work with you in the design of the art for a space? Well, when you are thinking about art for the space, I would encourage you as an investor, as a developer, to really determine what is the experience you want people to have when they're there. And then you put everything into place to bring that experience and that feeling to life. So for example, when you are selecting an art consultant, you're going to want to look for an artist or an art consultant that's going to bring your brand vision to life. Think about culture, think about telling a story of this property and what you want people to say when they're there. Those are the feelings that you want them to get when they are in the building and seeing the artwork. So whereas some people might say, okay, in my multifamily property, do I need to have pictures of trees? Well, maybe we can think about it a different way, right? How can we think about an experience? Let's say you're building senior senior housing or assisted living. How can you create a place that allows an ageless living experience? and celebrates the moments of your life that you want to feel close to in your golden years. Whether that might be a feeling of adventure or romance or connectedness or comfort or even play, how can you bring those feelings to life in an assisted living or senior housing experience, right? So it's more than just the image or the color. It's really about how to create a feeling. One of my mentors taught me something must have been a dozen years ago. He said, Victor, the product is never the product. The product is the product of the product. So what does that mean? It means why do you go out and you spend $2,000 on an Armani suit? It's not because you need that clothing for shelter. The reason you spend that and you buy that article of clothing is how it makes you feel. So it's the product of the product that matters. When you buy a drill at the hardware store, you're not buying a drill, you're buying a hole. It's always the product of the product. And so what you're saying is exactly the same thing. The product of the product is how does that piece of artwork make you feel? We have, for example, as part of this campus that we're building, we've got a couple of houses that are memory care facilities. So one of the things that's important is that that artwork be calming and not overstimulating. If it's overstimulating, like you're not going to put a scene of a naval battle or something like that on the walls, it will be too disruptive. 
but it would have to be calming colors, calming scenery, something that's going to be appropriate for where those residents are at that point in time. But you could, in a different situation, maybe you're doing a daycare, you would do something completely different. Yeah, and what you're describing in memory care, too, those were some great visual examples. And also keep in mind that art and culture is an experiential, multifaceted way of thinking. So you could actually even highlight other sensory experiences, too. A lot of times in memory care specifically, there's installations that have certain smells because your smell, your sense of smell and your memory are very closely linked. So having a garden that has lavender or sage could be really beneficial in an assisted living environment or a memory care environment. That's fantastic. Now, obviously, when you're using aromatics, certainly anything that's an aromatic chemical, you got to be a little bit careful because there are people that can have those types of sensitivities. But I completely get what you're talking about. So, for example, if, if you had an image of a still life with oranges, maybe you could have a citrus scent. Yes, exactly. That's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about budget. One of the things that a lot of developers struggle with is artwork can vary widely, a hundredfold in cost, depending on is it an original, is it a reprint, what's the cost of framing, what's the cost of hanging, what's the cost of protecting the artwork, protecting it from UV and all of these other environmental aspects. What's your advice to clients in terms of how to even think through that process? So internationally, when you look at public art, for example, now these are larger scale sculptures, typically wayfinding type pieces. But the universal rule across multiple different municipal institutions is 1% for the arts. And 1% is a metric based on your construction budget. So I think 1% is a really healthy way to think about your art budget. And keep in mind that should include everything. That should include artist fees, design work, consulting, framing, installation. That's an all-encompassing number, but gives you a quick reference way to keep that line item in your budget. And remember, too, the impact that art can have. So, for example, we have one property we're working on, a multifamily property, and rather than reskinning the building in a really expensive material, they're actually going to keep a pretty simple concrete facade and we're doing a mural on sections of the building to liven up the space. Now, from a numbers perspective, it's actually a very economical solution, but it's also a cultural solution and a community-oriented solution that engages with local artists and brings the neighborhood to life. So you want to think about the bottom line, but also think a bit bigger, too, as to what the impact is going to be overall. One of my old mentors, a gentleman by the name of Terry Matthews, he was the founder of Mitel and Newbridge Networks. At one point, he was the single largest shareholder of Alcatel because Alcatel acquired Newbridge Networks from him. He built an entire office park. and He's our local neighborhood billionaire. And he built an office park in a hotel. Every neighborhood needs one of those. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He was the chairman of my company back when I was in the tech industry. And he built a hotel called the Brook Street Hotel and thought very carefully about the artwork. So he commissioned over a three-year period from one of the high schools over 1,100 works of art. And in all of the guest rooms, all of the public spaces, 1,100 works of art all done by high school students throughout the entire hotel. And these pieces are stunning, absolutely stunning. And that's something that I've carried with me ever since hearing that story and, of course, experiencing it firsthand, that, wow, talk about an innovative solution. I'm sure he made a significant donation to the high school for supplies and all the rest, but, wow, he created a venue for these budding young artists to actually create a legacy piece very, very early on in their career, which I thought was just genius, absolutely genius. Think about the story he gets to tell with that too. And then all of the support for the building that comes from that, from the hotel. And then when those students have friends over or when people come to visit, you can guarantee that hotel is the first place that they go because they want to show off what they did, right? Oh, absolutely. And then we're talking about real economic interest. I mean, this is social capital. People are bringing their friends, they're bringing their colleagues, they're bringing their family when they're in town and they want to come see that hotel. They'll probably stay, maybe have a drink at the bar, have a meal at the restaurant. 
So, you know, there's, there's a lot of sense to supporting local artists in particular when it comes to those open spaces like hotels where you're trying to drive traffic. One of the things I've seen done in a lot of restaurants in particular is they almost turn the restaurant into a rotating art gallery where they essentially provide a, a venue for local artists to show their work. And the items are there decorating the restaurant, but there's also a little price tag and a phone number where they can call to actually acquire that piece if the patrons happen to fall in love with something they saw. Have you encountered that in any of your projects? Um, rotating art can be a little bit tricky because there are, I think, a lot of misconceptions about the benefits to an artist. For example, oh, as an artist, if we hang your work on the wall, it'll be great press for you. Now, the reality is sometimes galleries have a hard time selling artwork or drawing a crowd for an exhibition. So you've really got to come up with ways to have a mutually beneficial relationship with the creative community. For example, in that scenario that you were walking through in the restaurant, how many of those pieces sell? Do they ever actually sell? Or is the artist just putting them up for display and then, you know, people are spilling their spaghetti sauce and wine on it over the months and then they have to pick it up and, you know, clean it. Is it insured? So rotating art, while it can be a really good idea and philosophy, it has to be executed well. So a lot of times we'll recommend sticking to what we call the wage guidelines. And that's a working artist guideline on how to create equitable pay and provide stipends for artists doing a temporary exhibition. That way you're covered in case if something doesn't sell, and then you also get the best artist work. You know, they are going to bring their best to the table, bring the best artwork for you to select from, and it becomes a bit more competitive and raises the bar. So we're always trying to elevate the experience, not only for the property, but for the artist too. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Martha, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? Yes, please check us out at 9.arts.com. It's all spelled out, N-I-N-E-D-O-T-A-R-T-S.com. And you can find our firm there and learn more about us. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. So Martha Weidman, and my last name is spelled W-E-I-D-M-A-N-N. I -N -N. Uh, would love to connect with you there. Fantastic. Martha, thank you for the fascinating perspective. I learned a lot. And for the listeners at home, definitely connect with Martha at 9.arts.com. And in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.